as promised by me and endorsed by you, 100% Total Nerd Episode 2.0, and this time it's Break Mean Effective Pressure Like a Bastard. So lube up, ladies, and grab your pants. We're going in. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Aussie new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. This episode is rated N for nerd and P for physics and ICB for intracranial bleed, which might well happen if you're not careful. Suck it up though, because this is an omelette egg proposition in terms of the management of risk. And thank you so much for your positive feedback about yesterday's Cylinder Science and Engine Layout Total Nerdiness Vlog 1.0, which this report is kind of a continuation of. Many of you requested that I tack on the inline five-cylinder engine and the boxer engines as well, so I will work on this for you across the weekend. But tomorrow on the vlog, we're going to jump down off this metaphoric nerdy whiteboard and we're going to get hands on and figure out how to connect those jumper leads and ask the boss nicely about the combination of the safe. Really? Really? Yeah, well, I heard it's also a great way to get information from people just like that. Okay, fair enough. We, uh, we don't want to get demonetized, no. Yeah, yeah, okay. I love you too. Okay, bye. I'm being told that tomorrow we're actually going to jumpstart a car using the latent energy trapped inside an allegedly flat battery, because science. It's a pretty neat trick too, (laughs) nothing Guantanamo about it, nothing at all, but there could be. Now, break mean effective pressure, it's certainly a mouthful, a brain bender, there's a right way and a wrong way to do this, okay? And I assure you, we're going to do it entirely the wrong way. The filthy, stinking, cheating, quick, dirty way, because the alternative involves actual mathematical rigor. And I assure you, nobody wants that. A proper brainiac calculates BMEP using a formula and established units. If you want to do this, be it entirely on your head. You can take the torque at maximum power and multiply it by four times pi for a four-stroke engine, two times pi in a two-stroke, and divide that by the engine's displacement volume. And if you get the units right, That would be here in Shitsville, we use SI, but in Retardistan, America, you should be at liberty to use the imperial nonsense, which proves that you can make America great again, if by great, you actually mean Great Britain. (laughs) Vassals. Where was I? If you get the units right, you get an actual pressure in pascals or bar or PSI or millimetres of friggin' mercury if you want. BMEP is the average pressure that acts on the piston while it is doing actual work. What it's not is the actual pressure inside the cylinder at some particular point in time, okay? So, why do we want to know this? It's a great way to compare engines for how well they've been designed, and you can use that in an engine when it's on the drawing board, okay? If you're a propeller head. If you are designing an engine and you know how much torque is required, you can calculate how much displacement you'll need given some ballpark knowledge of best practice BMEP for that kind of engine in your industry. But more interesting for we car nuts who don't actually design engines, there are two big fudges for making more power when you're on the drawing board. 
you can just make the engine bigger, right? If you go from two liters to 2.5, you'd expect to get 25% more performance with all other things being equal. So that's kind of an easy win. Adding a turbo is a bit like that too, because it artificially pumps up the volume by jamming more air volume in. Or the second fudge here, even easier, you can just spin the engine faster, right? And I call this a midlife marketing department upgrade. This is the cheapest, nastiest way to get a nominal power increase. Power equals torque times revs, as long as the revs are in radians per second and not RPM, because applied physics. So you can maintain the torque and spin the engine faster and you will absolutely get more power. Let's say you've got some engine hypothetically making the numbers easy, it's developing something like 200 kilowatts peak at 5500 RPM. If you keep producing the same torque at 6000 revs, that's about 10% faster, you're going to make 220 kilowatts. Then when you refresh the model and launch it, you can say now with 10% more power. Yes! Never mind that this extra power is mostly inaccessible because people don't generally drive north of 5,500 revs and the engine feels exactly the same at all revs below that. The marketing department will be very pleased indeed with that alleged upgrade and the PR dudes will spruik it endlessly. And of course, maintaining the torque 500 revs faster means being able to jam 10% more air and fuel into the engine and then flow 10% more exhaust out. So the existing inlet fuel and exhaust system hardware might need a bit of a tweak as well. It's still a pretty low rent and mostly useless alleged power upgrade. Of course, the third and best way to get more out of an engine is with fundamental efficiency gains. By reducing internal friction, by improving the combustion management, by reducing the heat rejection into the parts, by boosting the volumetric efficiency, stuff like that. So wouldn't it be quite nice indeed to have a means of assessing the power production that is independent of revs and also independent of the swept engine capacity? If only we could find one which is of course what BMEP is. And I guess the mathematics with pi and all that, all that conformity with the units is kind of unfortunate. But if you're willing to let your grasp on hard science loosen just a little, you can bastardize BMEP and bypass a lot of the mathematical complexity. And that's exactly what you should do if all you want to do is compare engines in terms of their basic design efficiency, independent of revs and the swept volume. All you do is take the peak power, you divide it by the volume, and then you divide that by the number of thousand revs at which the peak power occurs. Dead simple. In the example I used yesterday, the big fat Hemi 6.4 V8 was making 350 kilowatts at 6,150 revs. So all you do is divide 350 kilowatts by 6.4 liters and divide that by 6.15 for 6,150 revs. You get 8.89 kilowatts per liter per thousand revs. And you can do that with other engines and then you see essentially who's got the best R&D. <laughs> You can use cubic inches and horsepower if you want, retardistan, yes, and you will get a different number certainly, but the same proportionality between engines. You have to be consistent though, use kilowatts and litres all the time, or the other units all the time, if you want the numbers to be comparative or meaningful at all. And you are actually calculating a pressure here. It's just not a pressure in units that are meaningful against the standard units we put pressure in conventionally. Dimensionally, it's absolutely a pressure. <laughs> just don't try to buy a pressure gauge calibrated in those units. Someone will definitely have an intracranial bleed here if I lay this, this dimensional analysis out in detail, but trust me or confirm it with a physicist or an engineer, it's true. This is the bastardized part of the whole process.
If you go out and compare a whole bunch of different engines, the bigger the number, the better, that's kind of how this works, more power per litre per thousand revs is good. That's what you're looking for. The only other thing I've got to say about this is when you crunch all these numbers, it's a great way of comparing engines of different displacements. But turbocharging throws a bit of a curveball here, a bit of a spanner in the works. Mathematically, because turbos increase the volumetric efficiency of an engine, a turbo kind of fudges the figures. If you do this with Atmo versus turbo, the turbo engine is going to win because it's a kind of under the table volume enhanced more, like having surgery down there. Petrol versus diesel too. BMEP paints you a picture there as well, but the results are not directly comparable in terms of whose engineers are doing a better job. The big difference between petrol versus diesel numbers is down to the fundamentally different combustion dynamics of the process. And before I let you go, just to complete this propeller-headed picture, the only other measurement that they use to do a related kind of comparison is a thing called Brake Specific Fuel Consumption, or BSFC. This is essentially the mass per second of fuel being burned at peak power divided by the peak power itself. So you get grams per second per kilowatt. It's kind of like units of fuel in versus units of power out. The only problem for us here is BSFC, the fuel one, is impossible to bastardise. You need to be a friggin' expert in a lab with a dyno and you need a fuel flow meter and all that stuff because car makers don't release that kind of data. So we recreational physicists here, we're stuck with bastardised BMEP and at the end of the day it's really just a curiosity. It's not going to help you go faster down a racetrack anytime soon, but it will show you whose engineers are doing the slickest job with fundamental design efficiency. And just to put into perspective the difference between production cars and race cars, the proper non-bastardised BMEP of a standard petrol engine today is about 10 or 12 atmospheres, ballpark. It's about 50% more for a turbocharged engine. It's 20 or 25 atmospheres for a turbo diesel and about 15 atmospheres for an F1 car from 10 or 12 years ago. Obviously the F1 car does its thing by revving like a bastard and the BMEP kind of standardises for revs so they're not really that impressive per rev. But finally, the BMEP for a top fuel drag racer is maybe about 100 atmospheres, staggeringly enough. That's about 10 times more than an Atmo road car. And of course, nobody expects the top fuel car to run for two to 300,000 Ks with a service every 12 months or 15,000 kilometres, whichever comes first. That probably wouldn't work out so well. Pumping up the pressure obviously has big implications in the longevity domain. I'm John Cadogan. Thanks for sticking it out this far, as the actress said so apocryphally to the bishop. It's been emotional. Most people don't know this, but that word emotional is derived from the old French verb emivler, which is derived from the Latin verb emivir, which means to move. Oddly apt in the circumstances, don't you think? So well done, you. Science rocks in the way that being an emphatically ignorant dumb shit does not. You've taken a step in the right direction. And that porn you were downloading is probably ready to watch now. Yes. Thanks for watching.